Elizabeth is a writer, historian, and experimental surrealist. She's been at Catholic Christchurch since 2016. She did her BA with us in creating professional writing, followed by an MA in creative writing. And guess what she's doing her PhD in? Oh, I think it's going to be Max. No, in fact, she is coming up to the end of her first year with us doing her PhD in creative writing. She's also very involved with the whole Kit Maps project. She's actually working with our Duke of Edinburgh participants, which is something that we've just set up. Literally, we had our first session three weeks ago. It's off. So after this, after, after the conference, firm in the face of duty, she will be there with our DME participants taking them through the how we do what we do. Um, however, before that, she is here with us and she is going to talk us through uh, what you could expect if you behave badly in Kent at a certain period on the trail of the hangman. Thank you. Um, Kate, can you load up my PowerPoint? I seem to be having, oh, okay, so she's on it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Right, so, <clears throat> on the trail of the hangman. A short while ago, I was looking up some research into writing uh, a story about what it was like to be hanged. I didn't really know, um, because quite often we don't get hanged nowadays as a recreational pastime. However, I did to stumble across a story of uh, a, a lady called Mary Bex. Now, as a student of creative writing, I love a good story. And as a student of history, I love a good story to pick apart and ruin it with facts, uh, which has actually got me recently into trouble with local historians um, in, in the Deal area. The story of Mary Bex is as follows. Mary Bex was walking along the ancient highway between the Kentish towns of Deal and Sandwich, and under her arm, she had a package. While she was walking along, obviously the desolate part of the road, she came across a man called Martin Lass. He was a deserter from his ship and a desperate man. He, deemed the, he demanded that Mary gave up the package that she was carrying. She refused to surrender it and Martin proceeded to bludgeon Mary to death on the lonely highway. Unbeknown to the killer, conveniently, there was a witness hiding in a haystack, <clears throat> which, is, which happened to be the young brother of Mary's suitor. So once the coast was clear, he ran off and told his elder brother, who spent apparently, again, two years searching for Lass, eventually finding him asleep in a graveyard in Folkestone. The killer was quickly arrested. He was very quickly tried, found guilty and hanged. Legend has it in Deal and the surrounding areas that he was taken to the site of his crime and hanged there. There's also a memorial stone, which we'll look at later, uh, to the event. And many local people think that's also the grave site of Mary Bex. A few things didn't add up to me, uh, for me as a historian. So I decided to, as, and as a writer really, to decide to have an investigation into what was going on there. So I, I thought, I'll go into the myths of hanging first. Now, this is in pretty much in order of how I discovered things. So the first myth I discovered, or what I thought was a myth, was, oops, a bit of lag on the screen, I might be jumping ahead. There we go, let's go back one. Was a thing called the hand of glory. So this was one of the first things that turned up on Google and I thought, okay, apart from the number for the Samaritans, which kept turning up as well, every time I looked up hanging, but the hand of glory turned out to be the hand that was taken from the, uh, from the condemned and using their own fat, a candle was made and it was turned into this uh, effigy, which when lit, a burglar could take it into a house and paralyze everyone within the house so you could burgle the house freely. Ironically, um, burglary would get you hanged as well back then. So that was kind of um, probably an own goal in many people's cases. But what that did lead to was another thing, another myth that I found that could be busted. And I found this was true actually, this is what people did with these hands. You'll see them in varying paintings uh, throughout history. But most of the time, 
this was very, very, very rare to be able to get hold of a hand like that unless you were robbing graves and bits and pieces. So um, the uh, hangman's victim was often just sent for dissection and was interested medically. Next myth I came across was one that commonly annoys me is about how English people in England people were hanged. So being taken away by the hangman, we'll see on a film or television program, you see the traditional American hangman's knot, which is like lots of loops around the thing. And if we look at this one here, this is an actual hangman's rope that's used in England. And as you can see, it's just a little eyelet and it's almost like a slip knot. Very convenient, very easy to use thing. Um, it's pretty much most hangmen look for a nice silken hemp, which was a nice smooth rope of good quality, around two inches thick. Uh, to use to hang people. Um, but it wasn't soft because it would be comfortable around the neck, far from it. Uh, it was just, be, it was less messy, that a harder rope would rip the skin away and you couldn't re re reuse the rope so easily. But it was very practical and the hangman often had to buy his own rope anyway. So they were quite keen to keep them at least a few times, a few uses. Them. So you see the difference in the knot, but the way you were hanged as well, wasn't quite as simple as just being, um, drop through a trapdoor either. So there's many ways of doing it. The medieval favourite was being turned off a ladder. Uh, you could be um, knocked off a stool, put on the back of a cart, and you could tiptoe your way off to see the devil from that way. There was a short drop, which wasn't a very long way through a trapdoor, and the long or measured drop, which was the uh, apparently more humane way to go. But whatever rope or method you faced in England, the idea was to get you dead. That was simple as that really. One of the other things I came across was the bloody code as well. Quite often it was you could be hanged for anything um, was the was the myth I read about and as I looked it up there was about 200 plus about 280 crimes you could be hanged about. Women unfortunately were hanged for concealing things like birth but most of the time a jury would endeavour not to find someone guilty if a crime was as petty as cutting down a young tree, for example. They wouldn't necessarily send you to the gallow. Quite often um, crimes you would be hanged for would be anything from murder to um, arson and burglary and robbery. They were the most common ones that I've discovered as we've gone along. The bloody code, of course, was uh, something particularly um, vicious period in time, which ended in 1862 when new laws of Acts of Parliament were brought in to sort of just restrict hanging to um, arts and murder and a few other things like that. Nothing too drastic for people after that. And of course the end of public hanging, hanging I discovered was in 1868. Now the next part of the myths I wanted to delve into forced me to have to peep over the borders into Sussex. I know Sussex is not really on Kent maps, but the people who were of interest were certainly from Kent in this case. The gibbet was a, a, a common myth, which I thought might have led to people saying about where people were hanged and on the site of a crime, where actually it's more likely you were gibbeted near the site of a crime. But gibbets were expensive. They were made of metal, they were, um, you had to put the gibbet up, big wooden posts, and then maintain it and uh, try and stop witches from stealing bits off of people. And uh, this particular example was one of the most complete examples I could find was a, guy, a chap called Breads, um, who uh, committed a crime in Sussex. But we can see a lovely example in his skull. Apparently his skull is still jammed in the gibbet, as you can see from the image there. But the Hawkehurst gang, uh, many members of them uh, were uh, conveyed or caught across the board in Sussex and uh, conveyed across there to um, to face execution. So um, ironically, not so much them being hanged in Kent, more in Sussex, even though they did come from our area. So I found that the gibbet was an unlikely fate for lass as well, um, mostly because these things are just too expensive and quite often uh, it's very sort of a London thing to have a gibbet. It's very London and it certainly seems to be very Sussex. Kent people were probably a bit tight and didn't want to spend that money, so they didn't. So um, apart from the benefits of showing off the bodies, it, it didn't really deter people. The bodies would fall through the cages and they were pretty useless really in the end as um, animals would run away from the remains and it'd just be a cage hanging there, so not very helpful. 
So the next thing I wanted to check out was where would someone like Last May, where would they have been hanged? So first, so thinking it was a local crime, I decided to search maybe Dover and I looked for the site at Dover Gallows, uh, which is um, next, it was next to a place called Black Horse Inn, which is now the Eagle Inn, which we can see uh, on the lower picture, uh, where it sits next, uh, sort of on the uh, junction of Tower Hamlets Road and the High Street in Dover. I, I discovered that not many people were hanged at this location, not really, not in the 1700s into the 1800s comparatively, and hanging stopped there in 1823 anyway, which was a clue. Why did hanging stop in one? Why did hanging stop in towns? Well, they started to move the, the, the main event, if you like, into Maidstone, which we'll talk about in a minute. My next thought, though, before that, was maybe they took him to Canterbury. So I checked out um, Canterbury's old site, Oaten Hill, um, and uh, there was uh, nothing really about hangings there, apart from about two or three people in that period. Again, they're all being carted off to Maidstone. The last hanging uh, out in the hill actually turned out to be in 1783, but there's a building we can just see on the top picture there of a, a, a sort of a Tudory looking building there, and that's um, Nethersole House. And apparently you could uh, maybe rent a room at the top floor there and uh, hang out and watch the hangings. Uh, so that house is definitely witness to quite some gruesome events. The next place I was thinking there might be a hanging was the old county jail in Canterbury and you can see on the map on the bottom there on Dunstan Street it's just up from um, the towers in the, in the, the west gate um, was the old county jail uh, again very few hangings recorded there they weren't very good at record keeping but most people you know kept some sort of form reckon again we've just find a couple of hangings there and that actually closed in uh, 70 uh, in 1808 with the last hanging at 79 again leading me to believe that someone like Lass would have probably been taken to Maidstone for their demise unfortunately um, although we're virtually sitting in the courtroom of a prison uh, on the university campus site. No one was hanged there by law. Um, it's a very boring prison in that way. Um, it has a lot of notorious things going on in it, but it certainly didn't see anyone being hanged as far as I know. So the next slide takes us to Moston, Maidstone, if I can say that correctly, and Pennenden Heath. Now, this was an interesting site. It was seen to be used for a very, very long time. Um, and mostly the executions there were committed by just turning people off the cart. So you just stand on a cart and the cart will go away and you'll just take a step off the end and then that'll be that. You would hope anyway. The last hanging there was 1830 on Christmas Eve. Um, again, it was the normal place for execution in Kent. And this is what I discovered using the new drop method which was uh, a, a sort of a way of doing a short drop to hang people and to kill them. But it wasn't very pleasant as we'll find out shortly. So Maidstone Prison started to be used as the next site for, um, for hanging. It was built in 1811 to 1818. And I knew this was outside Lassus's period, but it was interesting that people being hanged outside it until public executions were stopped uh in later in the 1800s and in the late 1860s and then um and then uh, they would all hang privately out of the way of everyone so i couldn't really find exactly who hanged who that was quite difficult especially in the sort of the 1700s but i did come across some other interesting stuff which did make it into stories and other things i've done in research um so let's meet a couple of the hangmen that we might have come across in the victorian age the first one this chap Calcraft was a bit of a mean guy. His active time was 1829 to 1874 as a hangman. Um, so he spent 45 years doing this job. Uh, his first job, though, up in Newgate, was uh, flogging juveniles for crimes. So you can tell he was a nice chap from the start. But he did enjoy the show of hanging. So one of his favourite methods of doing it was the short drop. So 
eventually when those short drop gallows were made it was just a sort of a platform where you'd just be popped on you drop through a trap door and that'd be that and then he would jump on your shoulders or hang on your legs and uh, make a big show of finishing you off he's responsible for an estimated 450 deaths the next guy who i discovered was uh, william marwood he was a proponent of the long drop. He sort of invented it, but this is the measured drop where they measured you, weighed you, and then just dropped you through a trap door. Quite often, that was a considered more humane way to die rather than being strangled to death by the rope. However, it turns out that maybe not so much fun. After breaking your neck, you probably were unconscious, but you were still asphyxiate. So it still wasn't very pleasant for you. So where does that all lead me? Well, as you can see, there's a few rabbit holes and I decided to, um, one of my stories was based in the Victorian era. So all that research was really useful. But what it did tell me was that I was able to find out a little bit more about the truth of Mary Becks and what happened to her. And this is, uh, the truth of the matter was, is that being a Christian lady, she was actually taken to, um, more than likely buried in Sandwich, in St Peter's Church there, as Bex is a Sandwich family name. Um, she would not have been murdered at the place she was, <clears throat> not been buried rather, at the place she was murdered. And for Lass, uh, he was conveyed, and we have evidence for this, conveyed to Maidstone, um, <clears throat> where he was recorded hanged on the 22nd of March in 1784, on Penedon Heath, um, which was the common place, of course. Uh, so he wasn't hanged at the murder site, and judging by uh, the locals, would have had to stump up for um, the uh, gibbet and the uh, appropriate um, fixings to hold his body up there. He's probably not hung in chains either there. So there's a tale that goes on which involves other authors, however, <clears throat> is that. The, um, this particular story, Mary Becks, because it was so shrouded in mystery and um, uh, mythology, it actually made this, the, the, the mythology story, made it to the ears of M.R. James, for example, allegedly, and who based the end of his tale called Martin's Close on the events that happened to last. And another all history, if you like, was that um, Dickens, Charles Dickens, of course, um, based part of his character Magwitch on Lass living in a graveyard to try and hide away from the law. I haven't found any evidence of either of those things, but I think they still make a good story. And as a, as a historian, I think I'll let that one go and go with it as a writer. So that was my brief little jaunt through history, just looking at where the hangmen come from and what they did and how it all happened. There's a lot more gory detail than that, but we do only have 20 minutes and it's not nine o'clock yet. So some of you probably don't want to hear these things, but thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Elizabeth. I love that idea of 